Hi everyone, uh, welcome to a little question and answer session. Now this is our first one we've done uh, since the website's been up and running and we've got a few questions asked and uh, I'm going to do my best to answer them. I will just say that when I answer the questions it's certainly not the only way you can do something so other people might do it differently but just as successfully as I would do it. So, you know, uh, there are many ways to do things and this is just the way that I do it and hopefully it might be of some help to you. So, uh, I'll get my book out. I've got my lovely book that Martin gave me. As you can see, he's mad about dragons and uh, a lovely little notebook which is full of uh, things we've been doing on the website and everything. So, and most of them are ticked off now, so we're doing well. Okay, so I'm going to start off with Anne. Okay, Anne's posted a question and she wants to know about what brushes do. The difference between um, a flat brush, what you can do with a flat brush, what I would use it for, or say a wash, a wash brush, and I'll show you them in a sec, and maybe a rigger. There we go. A rigger, we've got a sword liner, and what else we got? Um, we've got flat. I'll just use one of my Isa Bay brush, brushes, but I don't know, brushes as well. And I can show you what that does. So basically, we're going to demonstrate these brushes today, and basically, what this five brushes would could do. Now I can tell you now that with these, well, actually I'm going to bring one more brush into play because we can't forget about good old Terry Harrison and I bought this brush um, gosh a little while ago and it's a great brush Terry Harrison's series Pro Art make it and it's just fantastic for doing you don't want to overuse it you've got to be quite sparing with it but it's a good brush for um, describing foliage, tops of trees, canopy of trees, edges of trees and stuff like that. But be careful, don't overuse it because your painting will look wrong. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate that one as well. So let's uh, <coughs> get my palette out and uh, I'll do some painting. Okay, let's get started with a flat brush. Okay, and we'll just see what marks it can make. So I'm just getting lots of paint on my brush. And obviously the most simple mark you can make with a flat brush would be just a nice long line. Simple. Now that could be used for your horizon. That will give you a nice horizon for the sea. Um, plenty of other uses as well. You can use it like give it a nice wiggle like this and you get a lovely effect with it. Tail it off. It's good for uh, fence posts. I'm all down like that. Then you could use your horizontal line. And you've painted your fence with sort of minimal effort, really. It's also very versatile in the sense that you can draw nice sharp lines with it on its side, like so. And you can also use it just on this edge. For describing different shapes so there's a few of the uses you could do with a flat brush okay you might ask how would I translate that into um, an object or you know to um... so what we're going to simply do is a boat okay keep it simple so I'm just going to mix some brown up um, we'll do it here okay so this is just going to be a boat and it's going to be a boat on the beach. So we just have this how I do it. Then you'd have the bow sprit coming out the front. Put a bit of blue in it like that just to make it interesting. Clean my brush off a minute. Then you'd have some reflections on the part of the boat. Using my flat brush again, so I'm going to do all this with a flat brush. Maybe I have a little cabin up here. 
and that's using it on its sharp edge so we get a nice flat line and we could even put the mast of the boat in with it just straight up like that and we could put the mast coming down uh, we could even put some little ropes in just by touching the paper and put some little ropes in so that's you know just a, a, a little sharp outline there of what you could do with a flat we could also do a house with it really useful for roofs on houses just get some more paint let's just do um, what should we do we'll keep it and we can have a roof like that we can have Because you get the nice sharp lines. We have a chimney on there, one end, another chimney there. Um, we could put just drop your windows in. Like that. Get some green just to make a little tree we could use them for trees and shrubs just by pushing away from you and get another tree here so that you know you could do you could do quite a lot with a flat brush you know it's quite a versatile little brush you don't have to uh, use it solely for uh, uh, straight lines and stuff like that you can you know use it lots of ways then you can go back into that later when it's dry and draw a bit of detail into that um there are obviously another little thing you can do with a brush if you're drawing circles it, well, i'm probably going to mess this up but i'll have a go i haven't done one for a long time but they're quite good for little circles as well you can just pot it on its tip and just go like that so if you're drawing if you're drawing fruit or something like that they're quite useful if you use a bigger brush you can get them obviously a bigger circle um, that's quite useful and just drop a bit of shadow color in there just uh, a bit more red on it and just using it to draw the shadow out so you know there's a simple idea of what you can use a flat for the more you use it the more you get used to it it's one it's a brush i wouldn't be without they're fantastic brushes and really useful um my wash brush here well not really a wash brush i use this for sort of um painting um you know most of the time really and again you know this i'd be using for anything i can i'll just show you I can get a really nice sort of by pressing quite hard a lovely line of color or I can press hard and then slowly lift off and get a nice broken edge again that's just beautiful for water it's a lovely effect um, you can, like you say you can get thick lines you can get thin lines slightly thicker lines you can get that lovely broken effect on getting there by sweeping the brush quickly across the page or just like that and you get that lovely sparkle now that's just beautiful for for, for, for sort of showing water um, when the sun's on it you get that lovely sparkling sh shimmering sea um, dare I try and demonstrate the flat brush again and probably mess this up but we could have a boat a little sailing boat um, on the on the water here yeah, with using the flat brush could have the cells and a little sail down here and they have a nice little paint you know uh, in, in a painting if that's what you're trying to sort of portray it would look great it really would um, but again that's just using the flat brush after using the uh, mop brush
Then we have a sword liner. I don't use this very often, um, sword liner, but uh, it's good for doing leaf shapes, I've been told. So you can paint leaves with them. So that's, that's a plant. Just by... Um, like that, I suppose. You still get the nice broken effect. Bit of blue in there. So you can get a nice leaf shape with that. Yeah, they're nice for that. I would think for for painting leaves on plants, you one of these would be. So if you're doing lots of plant work and stuff like that, would be really useful. A really good brush to have. Again, like I don't use that very often because I don't do. You can draw the veins on the leaves with the pointed end. Um, stuff like that. But yeah, that's what that's for. And again, I suppose in these trees back here, if you want to put some a few branches in, it would be good for that as well to describe some of those. So we've got a sword liner, a flat, um, the wash brush. Again, I'll just demonstrate that down here. This would be for doing like a flat wash of colour. I'm not, I don't use it. It still points up quite well, but it's too heavy for doing a lot of work. Um, but if you wanted a nice flat wash of colour, you just start here all the way across the page. It holds a lot of moisture, so you could continue this wash down the page, no problem at all. As long as you've got the right wash, enough uh, colour mixed up in your palette, and just take it down all the way to the bottom. Of the page. Okay, that leads us into the Terry Harrison, Terry Harrison brush. Um, again, these are great for little trees and stuff. Um, let me get me. Uh, let's use the flat brush we, for this. So we're going to draw a little tree first <coughs> with a flat brush. I'm watching it put my hand on wet paint now. So we've got our tree here that we've drawn using the edge of the brush. Okay, we're just getting a little suggestion of branches and stuff. Then we get some green. On our brush. And we can just put in the canopy. <coughs> Excuse me. For the tree. Now that works, you know, brilliantly. A little bit of grass down there for it to sit on as well. A bit darker colour. But yeah, you know that this 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 brush is a, a really useful brush. You know it does trees. You could use it for uh, little bushes as well, shrubby trees, things like that, you know. But like I say, be, be careful not to overuse it because uh, if you did all your painting, you, if, you know, if you used it over, overly in your painting, it will make your painting look a little bit, I don't know, a bit overworked, a bit dry looking. Um, but it's a good little brush. So there we go. <clears throat> oh, we got the rigger. And the rigger again is for, you know, obviously for doing little branches on trees and things like this. So you can, with the rigger you can do branches on trees. Stuff like that. Um, it's also good for, you know, like on that house I did a minute ago once it's just probably not dry now so just to give it a little bit of uh, shape you can use it to draw around areas and put chimneys on and stuff maybe put a bit of uh, life in your 
and your roof and your windows. Maybe draw a little fence. That's uh, done a bit too low, just here. You know, it's great for your rigger. So there we go. So those brushes that I've given you, it's a quick demonstration, but those brushes I've given you, I've uh, you know, shown you, uh, will do most you need. I don't honestly really, unless you're doing really big works of art and you need to go up in your fl uh, flat brush size and stuff. But if you work in this size, you could do most things uh, with, with that. You wouldn't have any problems at all. Okay, so I, thought, I hope you found that one useful. And uh, let's move on to the next question. Okay, Terry asked a question on how do I put rigging in on boats? Do I use a brush or do I use a pen? Well, I actually use a brush and I use a rigger brush. Um, so I'm just going to quickly um, demonstrate how I do it. There's our little boat there. We'll paint that in a second. So we've got our boat, a bit of reflection down there, a bit of land for it to sit on. Um, <clears throat> the actual mast that goes up the top, I would use um, a slightly thicker brush. I never explained this one actually in the last video, but I, I love this little goat hair brush I've got. I use it a lot. It's a little Chinese brush. It's made of goat hair and it's really nice. It's quite springy, so you've got to be careful. Uh, with it, you know, you can get quite a thick line if you're not careful when you're trying to work finely with it. But um, just see one at about there. So uh, basically what I end up doing is drawing the line for the mast with this. And I go quite quickly because I want a broken line. I don't want a solid mass that looks really chunky and I want to keep it quite sort of lively and fresh. Make sure you got it straight. And just draw my line like that. So we've got the thickness of the mast. Probably I'll do with a little bit more thickness at the bottom, but that's fine. So we got our mast there placed, ready for the rigging. No, just sketching the boats. I'll as well do that bit. There's the hull. Try and clean my brush. Always have a little bit of shadow down this side. There we go. Right, so we've got our boat sketched in. We can just add the reflection um with the with the rigging yeah i would use a rigger for that which is obviously we've seen one of these i showed you a minute ago um i don't know if i demonstrated it when i did the last one but anyway i use the rigger so we have the sort of the cross trees in up there um i would probably turn at a slight angle I wouldn't actually use a ruler to draw the rigging. I'd use my hand. I'd do it kind of freehand. But I'm not worried too much about it being too accurate, to be honest. I just take the lines down. It doesn't matter if they're... I always find they look an awful... Oh, here we go. We have the boom of the boat in there with some... And that's exactly how I'd do it. Just like that. I'd keep the lines very free, quite quite loose um, yeah you know and not worry too much about trying to get a dead straight line with a ruler because it's a rigging because people don't view it like that people want the painting to look relaxed they don't want it to look like you've painted it painstakingly with 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 with, with a pencil or a pen just to get it perfectly straight you know um, but I just don't think our eyes work like that I don't think we view things like that so that gives you a rough idea you know of, of, of what we do there um for you know for uh for rigging so you could have like the cell cover on there try and make a bit more sense of it okay so i hope that helps and that you know that 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 would be, be the same technique i'd do if i was doing power lines or anything like that i'd use the rigger i wouldn't use a pen and i'd just keep the the lines nice and loose they might look a bit sloppy to you Okay, fair enough. That's because it's the rest of the painting is not done. There's nothing to take your eye away from it. You're homing in on that mast. But believe me, in a, in a whole painting scene, that technique works fine. 
So I hope that helps, Terry. Thanks for your question. OK, um, we're moving on to the how do you paint mist and fog? Well, I'm just going to do, there's only one way to describe that, really. Let's do a little demonstration on how to do it. Um, OK, then take it cool down the page. Right, so I'm just going to do a little wash down the page. I'm just cooling it down now as I go down the page. I want to make these trees look like mist hanging over the water. So I'm going to rush, wash the brush off now. Nice clear brush. Start lifting colour out here. Nice, lot of water. Keeping the, keeping the water moving down the page. So this is where our mist is, just at the water's edge. So I'm sort of just using the brush to lift out the paint, add more water. I'm still tinting the paper, but uh, then as I come down the page, as I come closer to myself, and I start adding more colour again. So I've got this illusion of something going on. In the centre of the page, and that's what we're doing. We're creating illusions. Soften it again, like that. Have some mist going on the top of the mountains. Lift out some colour. Then I get a smaller brush if I can find one. That's a little Chinese brush. And I'm going to paint in the tops of the mountains because we can see those because the mist is down by the water's edge. So we want to just paint in the tops of the mountains. But they can be quite soft. I want that paint thicker. tops of the mountains. We could have a little bit of mist going on up there so we're just going to sort of like drop in a bit of paint and then soften it in places. There we go. We get a nice illusion of fog and mist. So I'm going to get my nice bigger brush. You don't want to. My bigger brush again, just to lift some of this colour out at the bottom, just to soften the edges. look of mist hanging across the water and the fog coming up behind. I hope you can see this all right on the camera. Maybe a bit of fog around here. And we, maybe we could just put some darker colour in just to suggest the tops of the trees poking out of the fog. That's hanging around by the water's edge. Just in places, some little trees hanging around there. And then just go back and soften those as well with clean water. So you're just giving yourself 
nice illusion of fog. You're just building up different areas where the fog's coming in and out. Okay, that's quite a simple sort of approach to how to draw fog and mist, but it does give you an idea of what's going on. So, Martin, I hope that. So, that was just using blue, um, ultramarine blue, and a touch of cad red and a little bit of yellow oak at the top just to give a bit of warmth. But that's basically how you do it. It's just about softening those edges and bleaching out and sort of wiping out the paint until you've created a, a feeling of you know mist and fog and stuff like that. Okay, thanks for the question, Martin. Uh, Mark Abrahams asked a question on how do you go about framing a mountain your own work? Well, there's no actual real answer to that, Mark. It depends on how much you're prepared to spend, really. You know, you do need to get yourself a decent mounting machine. Um, I've got the frame coat. I'll link to the frame coat so you can see it. You might not have seen the post mount cutter. I bought that off eBay. It's not, uh, it's only a, it's more than a hobby machine. So it's okay for doing your own work. You wouldn't be able to do work for other people because it's too slow. It wouldn't be cost effective. But um, it's a good machine for doing your own work. It mounts pictures beautifully and accurately. Um, if you want to go down the framing route and actually putting the wooden frame surround around you and cutting glass and stuff, you need what's called a morso or a mitering machine. These are these can these run at about eight or nine hundred pounds for one of those. You can use a uh, what they call a mitre saw. Let's get a bit chilly here. Put me uh, jumper on. Um, yeah, you can use what's called a mitre saw. Um, now these these are hobby saws really. They they they're used for doing cornice and uh, skirting boards and things like that. Now I used one of these years ago for quite a while, and I but what I was doing with them because they they do the corners well, but they don't do do them brilliantly. And if you're going to be, if you you want your picture frame corners looking spot on, really. But I used to do um, hand painted frames. I used to decorate with wax. I, I used to do lime waxing and things like that on frames. I used to stain it with a colour, and then I'd apply uh, lime wax to the frame. And so you could you could cover up any little uh, uh, mistakes or any little gaps that might appear in the corners by using a hand mitre saw. Now these you, you can get these from any sort of like DIY store I guess for about 30 40 pound um, and they do work they're really good you know so you can you so by the time you've paid bought your your, your, your uh, mount cutter and you bought your um, mitering machine whether it be a mitering machine or it be a, a mitre saw um, yeah it's starting to add up a bit um, then you've got to think about glass cutting glass and everything um, unless you buy sheets in cut and you make your frames to measure the, the priest cut glass size and you need a big area to cut glass it's an awkward thing to do um, so again that's a bit of a problematic thing to have to do um, you can use perspex they do picture framers do sell sell perspex for framing I don't like looking at it actually because it often shows the uh, from the slight angle it makes the picture the, the front of the picture look a bit distorted perspex um, then you just need the other little bits uh, tapes and uh, a, a pinning gun for the back and stuff like that so I would think if you went down the the mitring saw route you could probably set yourself up doing your own picture framing for around about 500 pound I would guess you know you could be you could be in business for that doing it for yourself and to be honest it wouldn't take you long to uh, save um, set get the money back because the cost of framing in high street sh high street shops when you get it done by a professional is very expensive. You know, I'm looking at one of my pictures, and it's maybe A3 size. It's about forty five pound each time. Um, if I did it myself, I could probably do the material cost would be around about fifteen pounds per frame. So uh, you know, you would be saving a lot of money, but you need the space and you need um, the you need the space and you, well, you need the money itself as well so it can be a bit bit a bit awkward um but yeah it's not impossible so if people want to do that you know it's a good thing to do so i hope that answers your question mark if you if you, if you feel there's anything there you want to chat about any further we could do it in the uh, chat room or uh, send me a personal message and i'll help you out as much as i can thank you okay then i had uh, a question the last question from randy louise and it was um how do i uh how do i paint gray hair 
good question, but not a very easy one to answer because I'm not, you know, a portrait arts, um, artist. But I'll have a go. I'll do a little demo quickly, just very quickly. I'm not painting a portrait, just blocking in the colours. And then I'll just show you how I do it. So we're just imagining this woman's got grey hair, aren't we? Okay, so bear with me and we'll get started. Okay, Randy, I've done a little sketch here just to sort of demonstrate this. I'm going to try and get it as clear as I can. Um, I started off with a little pencil sketch. And what I'm basically doing, I'm leaving, I'm making dark, a darker background. And by the time I put the colour on the face, I'll actually be leaving the grey hair white. Um, softening edges as I go. But overall, it's going to be kind of a, like a, you know, uh, a much much lighter than the, than the background so uh, that is what's going to give it the appearance of, of grey hair so first of all we just want to put some colour on our on our person's face for that I'm just going to use a bit of burnt sienna and a little bit of uh, cadmium red and I'm just going to put some colour in maybe a bit of yellow oak as well in places and by putting the colour in I've already started that process of uh, you know, please ex excuse my portrait it's going to be very rough okay then I'm going to make sure I soften some of this hairline okay I don't want to have it look like that the hair is going to have landed from space onto this person's head so I'm softening some of the edges now and again then I'm going to launch straight into the back of the person's hair, uh, behind the person's head, with some background colour, making sure I sort of get softer edges and uh, let things bleed in a bit together. So now you sort of you've created that grey hair just by creating a background, just by something for it to sit against, and making sure you've got some um, broken edges. Yeah. And that is it. then what I would do is I work out what side I've got me so we'll have lots of bit of in there and just create I'm not going to try and paint every hair strand of hair I wouldn't do that in any case I'm just trying to create some texture with my brush to describe hair and break it up the viewer is going to do all that so this is a this is a simple demonstration on how I do it but essentially that is it I would paint the background darker. By the time I put some of the face in, um, I've dropped some of the features in. That will, uh, let's just put some of those in. So we can have the eyes. That's got a bit wet still. Never mind. <laughs> oh dear. Never mind. That's okay. You can create some features there. Um, a bit of shadow underneath the hair here, where the hair's falling, again down this side. And when that's dry again, you can put the put you know put the uh, better features in. But uh, a bit of something for the mouth. So what you're doing, like I just said, you could you could build this up a lot darker, obviously. But I'm creating the grey hair by doing a dark background, and by the time I put the face in, the you know the colours for the skin tones. That obviously creates a much darker feel. So you're 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 just creating that grey hair. That's all I can say. Once that's dry, you can then go back if you, you know and put a few strands of hair. Use a brush to strip to put some hair in. I'd use blues and greys and things. You know, uh, yeah, blues and stuff like that. But you can make that stand out even more by making the background even darker. But it will take ages that to dry, and I'll be all day. So. Uh, I hope I hope you understand that. You know, come down the forum and have a chat with me about it. Um, you know, I'd, I'd be really happy, and I'll be happy to learn how you would do it, and you know how you've got ideas of doing it. But that is essentially the way I'd do it: paint the background, paint the face. You're left with a grey, whitish hair. If it's a sort of a yellowy uh, grey, you could tint it yellow to start with, and then you could do the background face and da da da. If it was a bluer colour like mine is, you could do you could just drag some of the surrounding colour into the hair to create a bit of tint to it. But I hope that helps, and uh, yeah. Thanks for asking the question. I hope it made some sense. I think I 
rambled there a bit, but you know we could discuss this further. That's the beauty of these video these um, video responses to questions. Perhaps it's something we can now take into the forum and explore a bit further. But um, yeah, that'll wind up today's anyway. But uh, yeah, I hope you all <coughs> I hope you've all enjoyed it and um, you get something out of it. Thanks for watching. For thanks for watching and listening.